Thank you. Thank you, all of you, for being here today for this, um, I would say, this new format that we've tried to introduce uh, in the WBFSH uh, program. Today, it's a forum. So as his name, forum, means um, exchange, discussion between us, between uh, our um, speakers here and, uh, and the assembly in front, of, uh, in front of us. The subject we have been talking about is a traceability, traceability of semen from the stallion and the mare to the foal. And uh, so it's, um, yes, it's, uh, it's very involved all of us. And uh, first I will just uh, introduce very briefly our three speakers here. You have Anne-Sophie Levallois. She's from the semi um, stud farm, stallion owner and, uh, and breeders also. You have Arnaud Evin from Group France Elvage, stallion owner and also breeder. And you have Janet Nayoff from Nayoff Stud Farm, also stallion owner and breeder. So all of them are very involved in the horse industry. As an introduction, I would just uh, remind you just some things. I hope, some of, I hope most of you, not to say all of you, are reading breeding news because in the last months, in Breeding News, we had some very interesting articles about that subject. I would just say about the title of those articles that you will be able to find in the, in the previous edition. But one was Simon Traceability, is this a problem with no solution? One editorial from Xavier Libresh was Where will that race end? And another WBFSH Tribune, from Norbert Kemp was tradition meets science fiction. So here is really the heart of our subject today. And um, it's, also the, um, it's also following a meeting we had uh, last year in Amsterdam between the WBFSH, represented by uh, Nadine, our general manager, and <coughs> some stallion owners about that question of traceability and uh, breeding. And just to finish my introduction, I would like to read you the open letters at the stallion owners, but we, would sh we should see them more as the actors of the breeding, um, of the breeding, of course. And um, so I'm not reading it as a stud book director. I'm reading it as a moderator here and uh, as a speaker. You have these open letters. It's uh, in the room, but anyway, I thought it was good to read it again. And that's been signed by m some very famous and important, but not, it's not the most important, but, but very important um, stallion owners from France, Germany, Netherlands, Denmark, Belgium, and Sweden. So open letter, open letter to the WBFSH, to good practice of managing genetics. The globalization and international traffic and sale of fresh and frozen semen and of embryos and ICSI embryos require the urgent attention of the WBFSH. The national and international traffic has become so complex that mare owners and stallion owners face the problems of the traceability of genetic material of their stallions and mares. The fraud with fresh and frozen semen and stolen embryos is most likely to get out of control if no rules are set up under the supervision of the WBFSH. To be perfectly honest, it's already out of, the out of control. Urgent action is requested from the World Breeding Federation to have an international database or platform where all stud books will report the coverings registered for each stallion and each mare. This data should be viewable uh, by everyone registered as it's already in some case in some countries. This is the only effective way to trace the horses of spring worldwide and to benefit from an honest and transparent registration of coverings and embryos that have been duly paid for. We are fully aware of the WBFSH board's willingness not to interfere with the business between stallion owners and mare owners. However, our branch urgently needs regulation supervised by the WBFSH. Stallion owners are the first link in the breeding chain along with breeders. They invest in young stallions, new genetics, and contribute to the genetic progress and breeding program of stud books by promoting stallion approved in those stud books. This is also why they are prepared to encourage breeders to register foals in stud books that guarantee good practice in terms of traceability and transparency of cement genetic material. 
Even if a solid contract inside has the sale of semen or, or oversight or embryo, this does not exclude a subsequent control in good cooperation with the WBFSH and studbooks. In the context of a new zootechnical regulation, the covering certificate and the zootechnical certificate must be clearly re refined to allow breeders to register their force with the approval of the genetic owners. Therefore, we as stallion owner, agent, breeding centers and breeders in Europe ask for your urgent cooperation on this matter. This process will help facilitate the management of semen and oversight and enable the fair, ethical and transparent production of force. Our urgent request to the WBFSH is to open a database platform with unique life number, ULN, so every student book worldwide must go into this to register their falls. They will avoid double registration and will give a total resume of all the falls registered per stallion by any student books per year. The FEI must then, uh, must then use this database or platform to add all student falls results per horse per unique life number. So, that was the open letter, that's the subject of the discussion for the end of uh, this morning. And I will now leave just Caroline from IFC in front, just give you a brief um, summary of what the regulation, the European regulation says about um, certificates. I'm too small for the <coughs> microphone. Tu peux l'enlever, non? Je fais comme ça. For some of you, it will be a repetition because we uh, um, already talked about that um, a lot yesterday during the WIRDEC uh, meeting. Um, so I will try to do it uh, briefly. Um, in the European regulation, um, there are um, uh, three different kinds of documents. Um, the health certificate, the zootechnical certificate, and the covering certificate. So, uh, concerning the health certificate, it's um, a document that has to go with the uh, semen, and it's, uh, it's uh, a sanitary goal, uh, and this document is um, already described in the current regulation. So you have all the ref references on the on the on the slide, and uh, it will change with the new uh, animal health law that will enter into into force in uh, April 2021. So there are new models of uh, health certificate, but there are no main ch main changes in the in the um, in the in the forms. Uh, so it's it's uh, more or less almost the same. No no nothing uh, will really change. Uh, so this is the first part that you have to follow when you when you produce or sell or move semen. It's uh, this health certificate. Then there is a new document, uh, which is the zootechnical certificate, uh, which we discussed a lot yesterday during the meeting. Uh, we are deck. It's um, so this document is described in the zootechnical regulation. Um, so this one has a. A zootechnical goal, and uh, it's uh, currently described, uh, and there's a, a precise model of document in uh, one of the European texts, and we have received uh, from the Commission uh, a few weeks ago a project of a new model of document, and this has been discussed in an expert group, group in Brussels uh, um, in September. So the model of document will probably uh, change a little bit, but we've not received uh, the last version yet. And uh, what we discussed uh, yesterday during the WIRDEC is that for this zootechnical certificate, currently it's just a big mess because nobody knows exactly how to handle them. Uh, we don't really know which, um, which stud book has to produce them depending on uh, the breed of the donor. Uh, or depending on the breed, the stud book in which uh, the, the future fall will be re uh, registered. And we don't know in which stud book the fall will be registered when the semen is m moving. Um, so this is uh, the first uh, kind of difficulty we have with those uh, zootechnical certificates. And also uh, it's difficult to fill in the different parts because uh, all the information on part A are really uh, the pedigree of the horse and, and things linked to the stud books. But the part B, it's information uh, about the semen. 
and it's more or less what we already have on the health certificate. Uh, so it's, it's uh, the kind of information that uh, usually is a more uh, deep, um, uh, it's, it's linked to the collection of, of the stallion. Uh, so yesterday we discussed that and many stud books don't really produce um, cu uh, currently uh, those technical certificates. And uh, most of us just uh, produce something when, when we are asked uh, because someone really needs it, because some countries, some uh, uh, competent authority in some countries ask for them. Uh, but it's really, uh, like I said, a big mess uh, at the moment. And then uh, the third document, which is uh, much more uh, old, is the covering certificate which is something we all uh, know and uh, which is uh, really used by all stud books. Uh, and for this one, there's uh, uh, no definition in the European regulation. It's only said, uh, so it's also the in the zootechnical uh, regulation, uh, it's only said that the, the, um, the foals can be entered in a, in a breeding book uh, if they are identified by a covering certificate. Uh, but there's also a possible derogation, uh, but it has to be decided by the member states or by the competent authority, uh, and it can be replaced by, um, for example, a, a DNA uh, parentage uh, testing. So, for example, I know that the Connemaras in Ireland have implemented that possibility and they do not deliver any covering certificate anymore. Um, and then uh, the same regulation says that the breeding programs um, define all the rules. It means that it's in the breeding program that you define uh, in which condition you deliver or not a covering certificate, which are your rules. And, uh, and so it's not defined at an international uh, scale. Uh, so, so that's it. So it's, it's it's still mandatory, but with a possible derog derogation and no definition, which means that all of, of all of us can do what we want, more or less. <laughs> so that's uh, all I wanted to say on the regulation part. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Caroline, for this uh, reminder about the regulation. So now um, I will leave um, Arnaud to start uh, to speak about uh, about that subject, and then when three of them will have say what they want to say, <laughs> I would say we will open the discussion, and uh, and I really hope uh, that <coughs> you will have a lot of questions, and we will start to find a kind of conclusion all together. Thank you. Yes, just a brief introduction uh, to to this uh, subject. Let's agree that it's around 50,000 male foal born in the total of the uh, world breeding uh, stud books uh, for sport purpose. Out of this 50,000, it's approximately five new star every year entering the, the, the top 100 of the rankings, five to 10. It's not very important, but just the general scale is that is one out of 10,000 births who ends up as a star uh, breeding stallion. These uh, stars are produced with different ways. It's sometimes the single effort of one breeder, small breeder. It can be the effort of big breeders. It can be companies who buy foals to produce them as a stallion. But generally, the terms are the same. 10,000 birds <laughs> gives you 1,000 foals which will be pre-tested to become stallions, which will give you 100 foals tested as a stallion. 10 of them will be what I call survivors. They will breed without being stars, and one will, will be a star. All this process involves a lot of money, which uh, goes in several pockets of our um, um, breeding members, uh, veterinarians, uh, riders, and so on. It's a very, very large impact. The stallion production, producing a stars, involved a lot of money for the horse family. That's one point. It's a, it's a very important matter. The second point is just back in the story. When we started with the frozen semen in 1984, um, the stallion owners were entrusting the semen to the AI stations. 
and that was based on the loyalty and the communication between them. The semen was just a vector of the execution of the breeding contract between the stallion owner and the mare owner through the AI station. But because of some misuse of semen, because of some lack of confidence, also for some stallion owners for simplification reasons, uh, early in the 90s uh, started the sale of straws. So the straw was not uh, a vector, was becoming a product. Uh, immediately with that, there was more pressure on saving semen. Because if you have one straw, you try to, or, or ten straws, you try to make the best use of it. Pressure on saving semen means more vet, mid, more vet means more cost for the breeder. The technology has improved drastically in the, in the last few years. And now with the technology of today, with the OPU, with the XE, the potential performance of one straw in terms of number of progeny has multiplied by over 100. So the, the, the base of the price of one straw 20 years ago or 10 years ago has completely changed and the terms of the exchange has completely changed. And this, as my neighbors will tell you, not only involves stallion owners, it involves breeders and it involves the buyers of the, of the fall. All traffics are today possible. 99% of the population of the breeders are very honest actors, but the 1% of the, of the rest creates big problems. Because if the, the superstar is not rewarding the stallion owner, it's all the pyramid who produce this superstar who will, uh, will drop down. Just, we are talking not about uh, a caprice of the stallion owners, but a lot of a major aspect of the uh, economy of our breeding industry today. Thank you, Arnaud. So then, Anne-Sophie, I will uh, let you continue about the discussion. Yes, we had a meeting with WBFSH a few months ago, uh, and we end up by th thinking that what would be the best is to make a really secure contract to protect uh, everything. But we worked on that and uh, no contract can give a full guarantee. Uh, the laws are different in each country and they are also evolving constantly. So it's impossible to make a perfect worldwide contract. Sport horse breeding is widely open. It is almost impossible to control nowadays that those contracts are well respected all over the world. Then the sales conditions are getting more and more restrictive to limit the risks of fraud. Less straws are sent, lifefall guarantees are no more provided, which is not to breeders <coughs> nor AI stations' advantage. I represent the Ara de Semilly, and we are not only stallion owners. We are also breeders, and we also manage an artificial insemination center where more than 700 mares come each season. And I can tell you that the conditions are getting harder and harder for all parties. As breeders, each time we buy a bunch of straws without any guarantee, it's a big gamble. Sometimes we get pregnancies in these, but sometimes we receive a very poor quality semen and don't get any pregnancy and then lose a lot. As an AI center, we also have more and more pressure. When we receive for a client one straw, which costs a lot, even if we do our best, the mare doesn't get pregnant each time. And when the, the result is negative, as you can imagine, the breeder isn't happy. But even if an AI center knows his job and does it very well, it can't always make miracles, especially when the semen received doesn't meet the requirements. Anyway, it was much more comfortable to work with coverings, with lifefall guarantees, with a bunch of semen provided without any limit. But as stallion owners, we would like to be able to sell our coverings within those conditions. Actually, we did it by the past when we could have more control, and we keep doing that in France, and we still have enough control. But unfortunately, it's no more possible at a larger scale nowadays because it went completely out of control. 
So if you look further on to the other consequences, there is concern that the stallion owners won't be willing to invest so much to launch young stallions if no solution is found shortly, as Anu also explained. And they will end up selling only the semen of popular sport winners. But as you know, being a top sport horse doesn't mean, obviously, that it will be a top sire. It takes many years for knowing how a sire produces. And if we want that the sport horse breeding keeps improving as fast as it improved the last decades, it's important to keep launching many promising young stallions and make them cover many mares and test their offspring. And if the stallions owners stop investing so much in these young stallions because it's getting too risky, then the sport horse breeding progress will inevitably slow down. In conclusion, the current situation is not satisfactory for anyone. European rules have increased administrative constraints. We see that, and with the necessary to provide a zootechnical certificate in addition to sanitary papers. On the other side, the covering cars are not needed anymore to register a fall, which is abnormal, because it was the only way to provide better sales conditions to the breeders. At the sale of semen or oocyte or embryo, the sanitary papers and the contract already exist, proving the genetic, the sanitary requirements, and the sales conditions. Those documents are enough. We don't need another paperwork like zootechnic certificate, which costs time and money to provide and which is dangerous to deliver at sales of genetic material without any possible control later on to check that the sales conditions have been respected. Nevertheless, the delivery of this zootechnic certificate could take on its full meaning at the birth of fall before being able to register in any stud book. So I think that we need to work on it a lot. And we also uh, talked about uh, the database with a uh, unique life number. So there are some solutions to the problems, and they are not so hard to solve. Only an agreement between stud books is now required. Thank you, and Sophie and Janet. I will let you end before we start. Okay, to discuss with you. Um, I'm re representing here uh, Team Nayov. Um, I know, and, and Sophie already told a lot of the problems from the part of you as a stallion owner and an artificial insemination center. We face the same problems. We sent out semen for 1,500 mares in Holland and 2,500 mares aside of that all over Europe. So the traceability of the semen is a big problem. But this was already um, discussed and told, so I'm not gonna repeat that. But I want to also take your attention from another part of you, from the breeder's part of you and from the investor's part of you. If you are a breeder and you send uh, your mare for embryo transfer for ICSI, how are you guaranteed you get all your embryos back? Where do the embryos go? How can you trace what happens to your embryo? If you are a big investor and you buy in an auction uh, a heartbreaker um, narcotic embryo for 80,000, how do you know there is not 15 more? If I buy a nice uh, embryo in the mare and I go to the stallion show in two years and I find out that he has 16 full bro uh, brothers also coming to uh, stallion shows in the same country. So the traceability of the semen, the stallion owner part and the um, part of uh, being uh, a, a, a artificial insemination center has already been pointed out, but I'm, we are not just here for ourselves, but also for the breeders and for the investors and for all our breeding federation here all together to uh, protect our market and to um, make a secure system. Um, and in my uh, point of view is uh, we need an instrument of traceability for the benefit of all of us and um, I think that can only be done if we have a, a database with unique life numbers where all the horses can be uh, registered and found that are in the World Breeding Federation. 
That's it. Thank you, Janet. Now, um, I would say it's, it's open to you to speak. So does anyone here as a studbook representative or even readers as yourself or even probably insemination centers have any comment, any question? Yes, Eva. Eva Brümer from the Anglo-European Start Book. Um, I would li like to start by saying that we absolutely share your concerns and we would like to protect our stallion owners. We think that is a really important thing for us as a Start Book to do. Um, and we want there to be a high level of trust in the industry. I will say that as a Start Book, one of our problems is that we negotiate two different needs. We, we negotiate, we have the requirements absolutely of the stallion owners. Um, of the breeders, of traceability and of fairness, but we also have biosecurity um, demands that are put on us by um, our um, national ministries of agriculture and by the European um, legislation, which means that there cannot be any horses or any foals that do, are not registered, that are not given ID papers. So that means that we are, um, for biosecurity reasons, every single foal that is born, whether that, um, whether that semen that created that foal was come by by legal or illegal means, still needs to be identified because of biosecurity and food chain security especially. And that, that is something for us that is sometimes quite difficult to balance out those two different requirements. So when somebody sends us registration papers, um, we are actually obliged and we cannot just say, well, we can't do a passport. What we can do is we can decide what we will put on that passport. So in other words, whether we consider a, you know, whether we would um, consider the evidence provided to register that fall sufficient to record the pedigree or not, for example. But all I'm saying here is, is that it's, we are, we are a little bit limited by what um, our national ministries tell us we have to do in terms of what sanctions we can impose. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, uh, I think it's a common point with all the stud books and that has to be into consideration to create the solution. But the first point is, do we want this solution and what are the other obstacles? We should make a list of the obstacles and if it's the willingness to create the solution, we'll have to take into consideration all those parameters and, uh, but I'm pretty sure we're going to find a solution. But I understand what you say, and it's probably shared by all the other stud books. Chris, Chris. Where is Chris? Chris. Yes, Chris Gould from uh, Canadian Warm Blood. Uh, just, I don't want to be too naive here, but just to be clear, can you explain to me exactly, are we talking about indictable crimes actually stealing of yes. semen, and can you explain how that takes place? Because I normally buy semen as a product, which as you had explained how that evolved. Um, and so what I do with that semen as a product is clearly my business, but maybe you can explain to me. And if I buy semen as a, as a LIFO guarantee, then is that the area where people are uh, taking semen from the LIFO guarantee and not reporting that they've used? Or just explain to me the details exactly how these crimes are committed. You want, you want some uh, examples of fraud? <laughs> okay, I understand. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, but uh, it's, it's a lot of ways. When. Uh, um, when my examples. Yeah. yeah. There's difficult kind of semen sales. You have straws being sold in the past. So if you bought a straw and you have an invoice, you legally bought the straw. It's your semen. You can do whatever you want. There is another market which is fresh chilled semen and frozen semen that isn't sold by the straw and is paid by the pregnancy. So to give an example that I have been given this morning is uh, of a breeder who owns uh, one dose of fresh semen of Johnson. Two days later, the mare has not ovulated. He orders semen again. Three weeks later, he says the mare is not pregnant. He orders semen again. Um, then um, six weeks later, the mare is not pregnant. He says, my mare is so difficult to get in full. Can I please get a double dose? Um, the other, um, sorry, the other um, part was uh, 
he ordered semen from another stallion, just saying that the, uh, the mares are very difficult to get in full. So four, four times he orders fresh semen. In the end, I tell him, if it's so difficult, send the mare to us because we can make the mare pregnant easily. And then he said, no, I think they are pregnant. So when we checked one year later, he paid for one Johnson breeding and one for Florencio, and six Johnson foals were registered, and seven, uh, five Florencios were registered, while he paid for one breeding. But this is our personal problem between the stallion owner and the mare owner. That is not what we are here for today. We can solve the legal problems with our mare owners that don't meet the regulations. The only thing that we want is to regulate the traceability so that we can see these foals are born, you bought it legally, you have paid for the semen, it's okay, but there is two or three that, that haven't paid. But, and also for the mare owners to see how many embryos are produced. And if you have a unique database with live numbers, you can also put the sports results to it and you have one unique beta, database with all the horses and all the sport results and you have all problems um, solved in, in one unique database. It's 2020, we live in a global world. 30 years ago, it was the next door breeder breeding. It's not anymore. If I go into the air in the airplane, there is rules for traffic, so the planes don't crash. If I go on the road, there is um, rules for the cars on the street. And if we go into international uh, semen business and, and semen selling, we need some rules and we need some clarity. So it is, we have to find an instrument altogether to trace the semen. And it's uh, uh, our common um, responsibility to find uh, a unique system for that. It's not, it, and uh, it's, it's part um, to, to find the fraud, but like they said, the fraud is maybe 2%. It's like all the honest people that we are talking about now for the dishonest people, but it's also the transparency, the number of unique numbers. So I have a list and know that all my foals that are born, I can see in one list. Five are born in Sweden, 10 in Hanover, five in Holstein, 100 in Holland, 50 in Belgium, uh, 25 in France, but at least I have a list and I have all the unique numbers. And as a mayor owner, you can also see how many embryos are registered or as an investor, like I said before, I know that I am buying one embryo out of, um, of many. So it's not just the, the fraud and the, 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 the legal part between, that is between the stallion owner and the mare owner, that is no stud book business. It's just that the, the, now it is provided that people have papers and we cannot find them, or only seven years later when they go in sports and they say, hey, this mare was declared empty six years ago and now there is a, a horse jumping at an international show. It takes so much time to, to find that out. So it's this total complex problem that can be um, taken care of with, with having a unique database. You, you want some more example of fraud? <laughs> no, uh, uh, if if some stallion owner are selling their uh, uh, their semen based on a, a live foal guarantee at some actors and on uh, straws at some other actors because they are big breeders or they are far, you have semen traveling with two status. And if I sell you, for example, the straw of my stallion at 600 euro per straw and if I entrust this semen to your neighbor, because he's selling on my behalf uh, uh, life for guarantees, he's very inclined, he has plenty of straws, he's very inclined in selling you straws uh, for maybe 200 euros, which I'll never be paid for, and, uh, and you, will, uh, you will declare that with the five straws you bought from me, you got five folds, where those five folds might have been done with the five straws you bought from me and the 10 you bought from uh, my agent and have more and more, but uh, I try to keep them secrets. <laughs> but it's, it's not very difficult to imagine. Okay, Jan. Okay, Jan Peterson, uh, World Breeding Federation. I would like to um, stress that we acknowledge the problem and uh, we realize that this is not only a problem for the stallion owners, but for horse breeding in general. And we are interested in cooperating with the stallion owners, uh, trying to find ways to solve the problem. Um, I don't know if, if what you suggest in this open letter could be the solution. It, it could be, 
uh, I would like to draw your attention to the last paragraph. It says, our urgent request to the WBSH is to open a database, a platform with unique life numbers. So every start book worldwide must go into this to register the, the folds, must go into this. No. You must realize that even if we come up with an agreement, then we are not in the position as World Breeding Federation to demand that our member start books uh, participate. Of course, we could try to persuade them, but we are not in the position to, to force it upon them. No, no, but uh, if it's, I mean, to become a member, and, and, and certainly I appreciate very much what you said in taking this problem into consideration as the problem for all the breeders, not only the stallion others. So that's a uh, that's very good uh, fact to, to point. Uh, but to uh, be a member of the world breeding, uh, a stud book has to comply with uh, some... Uh, with some requirements. Just add the transparency in the database as a requirement, and the student book who comply stay member. The student book who don't comply, they are not member anymore. And believe me, we'll be enough pressure from their breeders to stay members of the world breeding. It's so many privilege attached to being breeding in a student book member of the World Breeding Federation, that if this is one of the reason, one, one of the obligation to be member, they'll all do it. Yes, good, uh, good morning. My name is Frederick de Bakker. I'm not um, a member of the World Breeding Federation yet, maybe one day. Um, I sit here as um, a part of Hipermundo, a project that you may or may not know. Um, Hipermundo collects breeding data and collects sports data, connects them together and provides information to breeders. That's one part that we do. The other part that we do is that we have created a partnership with several stud books. Um, many of them that are here. And I just want to point out, and I do not take any position in the problematic that is being, being drawn here, I just want to point out that each of these stud books that are linked to our database have got full access to each UVLM number of every horse in the database. So the basic problem that you sketch can be solved very easily. It is being done today. The, one of the difficulty. I'm, I'm, uh, thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm back to your uh, remark, Mr. Peterson, is that if one of the members don't comply, so it's one part of the room out of control. So it means no control in the whole room. So it has to become one of the requirements to be member. If you think it's important and it's important enough for the survey of this uh, economy, it has to be one of the rules to stitch ways to, be, uh, to become or to stay a member. I think it's no alternative to that. It might take time. Maybe we can start with the, uh, with the zootechnical certificate, but this is the aim. Uh, once again, 99 point something of the population of the breeders is perfectly straight and honest. But, but it's just this fraction that we have to be able to find out and, and we'll move to 100% quickly. Yeah, I'm Uli Hane from Hanover, and the stallion owners who work together with Hanover shouldn't have that problem because we send a list of our folds we register each year. It's for a reason, um, because we uh, make the stallion owners be part of the DNA costs and of course for that they become the li and they get the list um which information should be um given in this database together with the unique queen life number name of the mayor life number of the mayor and eventually if it's a suspicion of fraud name of the breeder who register the fall and his phone number I think, it's, okay. I think it's like you do now. You send us a perfect list of the unique life numbers. It says the father, it says the mother, it says the breeder. So it's perfectly for us to trace. You are a perfect example of how we would like to receive this information of any stud book. Yes, but I think we will have a problem um, if we publish um, the name of the breeder. Uh, in a database, in an open database. That uh, would I be agree with you for uh, protection of data. So um, it, it has not to be public. It has to be made on request 
of a stallion in case of suspicion, in case of fraud. And there you, you'll be freed of the, of the database, of the, 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 the data protection uh, rules. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure, I'm not a lawyer, but I'm pretty sure that you're right in saying that you cannot publish everything accessible to anyone. But, uh, but just as a service provided and paying service provided to the, to the stallion uh, owners, uh, you should be able to provide them with one particular information in case they declare it's a suspicion of fraud. But what, what you are doing is indeed very close, uh, Jeanette, of what we expect. But if we can avoid to have to uh, interrogate uh, 80 different student books one per one by having all of them with your uh, virtuous attitude or the, or the, the one we have with, uh, with the CR system in France, it will be perfect. And another question is um, we have to take a lot of fences to um, issue passports. Um, and if we have another, I don't want to build additional fences before I can issue a passport. Um, by ourselves, by our own um, organization. So uh, um, I'm a little bit afraid um, about the topic that we have to uh, fill in the database before we are issuing passports, by because in sometimes the work has been done um, directly to the breeder, and that should be our, our first aim. I just have a question for you. Um, what do you request today to register a foal? What is compulsory for a breeder to register a foal in your stud book? Yeah, we need uh, at first, of course, we need a breeding certificate um, that the breeder is able um, to register a foal, so um, otherwise we cannot register. And we have, of course, in DNA, we make a DNA for each foal and DNA test. And, of course, um, we have to deliver the data into the national database. Um, and if that's not correct, complying with any numbers of the breeders or the transponder or anything else, um, yeah, we fail. And so if we need uh, to stack the data in an additional database, again, before we can do anything, um, I would be afraid of that. Okay, but what is on the breeding certificate? Who signed it? Wh wh what are the information? I uh, is it given by the stallion owner or by the vet? Uh, it, it depends. Or it no, it depends um, on the semen. If it's fresh semen, it's done by the stallion owner. And frozen semen, it can be done by a vet. Done by, sorry? By a vet. By veterinarian. So there is no, uh, to, to <coughs> register as a foal, there is no checking about where the semen come from, actually, if it's not uh, fresh semen. That's a problem uh, with frozen semen, yes. Okay, and I just have a question for Eva. <laughs> Just to, to cross, uh, quite, quite uh, the same question. Um, when you said earlier that you register fall, anyway, I would say, wha what do you request to register the fall? You say that you have to register the fall when the breeder asks right. for. Yeah, so uh, the, the, way we, um, the way we do this is when people send us a covering certificate. I mean, we require a covering certificate, of course. There are sometimes exceptional cases where a covering certificate could not be produced. Um, for example, where um, a stallion owner has gone bankrupt and no longer exists, de facto, we've had this, um, then people cannot produce a covering certificate, in which case um, we investigate and we ask for a proof of purchase of the semen um, and a DNA test. So there are, but those are exceptional cases. We will not register a fall without a covering certificate as by that stallion. The problem exists that there is a requirement for every foal that is born in a country to have a passport. Now, therefore, what happens is if people have got foals that say they have produced fraudulently, they have a few options. They can go for an ID-only passport with an ID um, uh, start book, only it's start it's book, which is not a... identification paper. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And that happens. We have a lot of those in the UK, and uh, a lot of people don't care because they just want the horse. They don't care what the papers are, mm -hmm. and there's very little we can do to regulate that. If somebody approaches us as a stud book and wants to register a foal, and we have been notified that there could be a case of fraud, we are obliged. I asked DEFRA and Trading Standards about this very case because, for example, sometimes it's a little bit... It's some, there's a lot of gray areas as well. So what can happen, for example, I had one case where there was a joint ownership of a stallion. Two people owned the stallion together. Then they fell out with each other. 
the stallion actually died, but there were some doses of frozen semen left over. Now, who owns those doses of frozen semen? You know, and there can be a lot of discussion <laughs> and a lot of legal dispute, and it's not down to us as a stud book to make that decision, but what we say when we've been notified that there is a reason, reasonable dispute, we, um, we uh, withhold the information of that pedigree that is disputed. So we can issue um, ID only or auxiliary papers, for example. We cannot refuse to issue papers. That is but what you print the pedigree in the passport. No, no, we wouldn't then. then. You wouldn't. Mm -hmm. That's the point. Yeah. That is the only little bit of sanction that DEFRA allow me. I've asked them and trading standards. That's the only little bit of sanction they allow us is to um, not print the pedigree if there is reasonable doubt. Um, and but the reality remains they people will go and register somewhere else and if we even if we all agree as world breeding federation stud books all together that yes we will all stick to this they will find other stud books that are not member stud books yeah but they and will lose their rights they <coughs> they will lose certain benefits for example they can't come to the world championship, world championship exactly rankings yeah and, uh, but um but what i will say is is i think you i think i agree that traceability and transparency is the way forward. Um, and, and that rather than, as a start book, when I look at the practicalities, the, the office staff are not in a position to settle legal dispute. <laughs> you know, and that's the reality. Yeah, but wouldn't I the think problem be already solved if you uh, request a zero technical certificate when you issue the passport that you have uh, a certificate where the semen originates from? We, we do in principle. Um, what's happening at the moment is we issue zoo technical certificates on our, on our website together with the covering certificate. So a stallion owner logs in to issue a covering certificate and we produce a zoo technical certificate as well as a PDF at the same time because we found that works quite well. Um, the issue that we have at this year, certainly because it's a new thing, we see, I've asked the breeders and I said, so are you getting your zoo technical certificates with your semen? Because a lot of our breeders use semen from abroad and it's very sketchy. Um, it seems to be that some semen arrives from Holland and Germany with zoo technical certificates and a lot of semen doesn't. It seems to be that um, chilled semen very often arrives without zoo technical certificates. That seems to be what we're finding. But you can ask for the, uh, the, the, the certificate when you need it, when the fall is registered, not just for the transportation, you but to issue the passport. You could, but the legislation actually says that it should arrive with the semen, because actually the vets should, should have that if when they inseminate. Mm, yes, but the vet already has the sanitary papers, and on the sanitary papers it's written that uh, it's the semen of this stallion. So I don't, I don't understand what they need the, cert the zoo certificate uh, at the beginning because there is the, the sanitary papers already proved the, uh, the, the genetic. I agree so it's with useless, you. but the, if the zoo technic certificate is given at the birth of four by only one entity, then it could solve all the problems because if it's given by one entity and stamped by the stallion owners and the male owners, it proves that the genetic has been uh, acquired uh, in good mm -hmm. conditions and then can be, uh, uh, th they can ask for a, a birth uh, certificate in any stud book with this uh, certificate. I agree with you in principle. I think the problem is that there, is a, there are a lot of different interpretations of the zoo technical legislation out at the moment. Yes, and, and it's a mess at the moment. So it's yeah. uh, I I we, ca we can change the things and we can define something which is good for everybody. So it's the moment to, to change it and to say what we need and what we want. Michael Stilwalt, uh, Portuguese start book. I have a question. Could you please define what you mean by the covering certificate? Sorry? The covering certificate. Yeah. You mentioned you want to impose a covering certificate. Can you define the covering certificate? When should that be issued? Th the covering certificate in France, we do that uh, when the mare is inseminated. Uh, at 15 days after the insemination, we have to, um, to declare the inseminations. The AI centers have to declare the inseminations to the, the French database. That's, that's what we do in France. 
but in other countries uh, they don't do that and now European law says that it's no more required. So that's why there is this new thing which is named ZO certificate, uh, ZO technical certificate and even if we can do it at uh, the inseminations, we can do that at the birth of fall. And now with ICSI and all the other techniques, uh, the inseminations, it's, it's not the important time because you can do the insemination, then make an embryo transfer, then freeze the embryo, then replant it a few years after. And so what is important is when the fall is born. And that's why the zoo, the zoo technical certificate, it's, it's better if it's given at birth of the fall. Yes, Dr. Hamzan, Norwegian Warm Lab. We uh, ask for a certificate uh, when we do the registration, and that means a confirmation from the stallion owners. And we think that we are in position to do that, even if we have to follow the rules, because I think that every book can still sort of describe their own rules, uh, whether they want to put the, the foal into the main stud book or with res uh, limited information. So even if we are, uh, uh, are uh, or need to, to, to do the registration and to issue some papers, we can decide uh, what kind of rules that is needed for the different parts of the stud book. So I think we can still do that and operating in the in b b uh, inside the legislation. I'm, I'm sorry, Chris. I just have one more question before. <laughs> is there in the room any stud book which does not require the covering certificate? So all of you require the covering certificate? No, some don't. Okay. Mm. Yes, it depends on what. Okay, also the, same in the same in France, we it it's done online, but it's, uh, it's, requ it's requested by <coughs> the stallion owner, which deliver it to the breeders, the to the, AI to, the, um, to, to the software database, but it's different from the birth certificate. We, we don't do that. We, we have a system so that the stallion owner has, before the, the foal owner can get the papers to apply for a passport, the stallion owner has to approve each and every yes, one. The same as the yeah. Yeah. That would that be perfect. Yeah, so Th that's, that's our system. So but we don't <coughs> have any papers, not certificates, but it goes through the starting owners before they can get their papers for registration. And do, do you know any, uh, any example of breeders which who don't have the papers, so they go to another studbook, or do you think that they are well, all... Of course, we never know those that never come to us. Yeah, if, if, they if, we, if they don't report a fall, we must uh, think that there was no fall because we also have a problem that there are a lot of mare owners that don't register the their mare in the system, system if the mare system. doesn't get pregnant. So we, we of, of if they don't come to us to, to get this registration paper, we wouldn't know if they go to another stud book. We have no idea of knowing that. So that's why we would need an international registry. Yes, that, that's, that, yes that's also a point because, uh, okay, the mayor cannot be pregnant or can be, but register somewhere else with some other rules or some... Uh, okay, Chris, it's not your turn. <laughs> I just wanted to make a comment because um, what, what you all say about uh, we, can, uh, we, we can ask a covering certificate and or, and or ask the agreement of the stallion owner uh, before we issue passport, it, it works in most cases, but when you have frozen semen and when you don't have a stallion owner because the one, you only have a breeder in France uh, who has a foal which is born and he bought legally frozen semen to someone, this someone bought legally or not, we don't know, to someone else for a stallion that is not even in your country. So in these cases, it, it's just impossible to, uh, to have the, 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 yeah. the, what, what, the, the, the initial <laughs> covering <laughs> So, and it's those cases for which we have problems and with ICSI and so on, it's uh, getting worse and worse. And there is no definition, as I said, in the European leg leg regulation of what is a covering certificate, who has to validate a, a covering certificate. And it's exactly the same with the, with the new document, uh, zootechnical certificate. And uh, the commission 
They never intend to make regulation on, on the sale of semen with those documents. They only try to, uh, uh, the only goal of the new uh, zootechnical certificate is, is to have the name and, uh, of the father and the mother and so on. It's not to regulate the sale of, of uh, semen. And one last point, uh, I think what you asked previously is not to, it can be to have an international system and to block everything, but it could also be at least to have the information so that you can control afterwards that's not that's and not it. to block that, that's exactly and not to block the printing of the passport but no. to be able to know that in in the whole world there are uh, and you have a number of uh, and this is not complicated and you don't need to build a database to do that you only need to have a hub like we talked about yesterday uh, with all the stat books giving the information and the hub uh, allows you to enter with the EULN number of the stallion and to, with the hub, you get the information coming from 80 stud books, and, you, and then you can do your uh, work with your lawyers and so yeah. on. It's yeah. a bit different. Uh, and, and, and I guess that we will start with the day one, not talking about the past, I mean, not talking about Diamond, Canaan, or Earthbreaker, but with the new stallion, <laughs> the new, yeah, new genetic. The, it's, it's right, it's two, it's two important things. Um, make the fraud more difficult. Uh, the, the, the issuing of the uh, zootechnical certificate at the birth will facilitate the, will, will, will make more complicated the fraud because somebody will have to sign that I was the owner of the semen uh, on one document to allow to register. So we as a stallion owner don't ask the stud books to make the police just to help us and then we'll have to, uh, to uh, go back to the people which uh, registered illegally or uh, in our opinion, and legally, then the hub or the database, call it whatever you want, it's a technical problem, uh, will help us to find and say, okay, Mr. Uh, X in this country has, um, has a contract, uh, as a registered for, where does he get the semen? And then we will have, as, um, as a stallion owner, uh, to, to move all the chain, but at least we will have the first name, will be the name of the person who has issued the, the zootechnical certificate and, and he will have to prove us that he had legally from somebody else and so on and so on and, and when finally one out of thousand we will find somebody who had this semen illegally then there will be a bad day for him hopefully i think i agree with i know what we need is an instrument of traceability um, so we can trace the semen, we can trace the foals that are born, and the legal part is between uh, us or the, the people that we want to pursue or think we need to pursue, but that's our problem. We don't want to delay any uh, issuing of passports or papers, or it's just what we are asking for is an instrument for traceability uh, for the stallion owner's part, for the mayor owner's part, and for the investors that buy um, embryos and ICSI embryos and normal embryos. Um, my turn now? Okay, thanks. Um, Chris Gould, I'm going to speak right now as a vice president of the WBFSH uh, responsible for the Department of Internal Cooperation. And I just want to remind people that the WBFSH is made up of member stud books. So uh, we act uh, on behalf of the member stud books, but our mission is to serve the breeders. So you can understand we have a, a tiered uh, situation. And over the past, um, I would say at least two years, we have been looking very closely at the um, technical situation regarding the exchange of data We've been looking at it for more than 10 years through HORDEC in, in terms of creating this hub. We now have, have HorseLink as an initiative that we think is going to uh, provide that process. So what I'm going to tell you is that as a member of the board, the message that I am taking back is that from the grassroots, from the breeders themselves, uh, yourselves, <coughs> uh, we have a strong impetus to continue with our efforts to develop levels of cooperation and international traceability. We also have the issue of the, of the um, uh, WFS or WWF um, syndrome as well. So um, you have to be mindful that we also have um, uh, sport results and we have a lot of issues around the question of accuracy of papers and pedigrees and, and duplication of UN. So um, I don't think, I think that there is a, 
solution um, that is connected to uh, from many fronts. And that, that is going to be a challenge. So I would encourage all of the stud books here, and that's what we've been talking about the last two days, and, and certainly in terms of an international breeding value that we're talking about, we, have, we are laying the groundwork for many positive things that we can do uh, cooperatively. It, it is going to take um, a, a lot of goodwill and willingness on the parts of the stud books. So we're hoping that the grassroots are coming to their stud books and saying to that management, cooperate at the WBSH level because that is who our, our members actually are. Good to hear, Chris. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And I think that is the whole issue. If you have one good computer system where you can find horses, the results of uh, the sports, we have one database. It's ridiculous that in 2020, I cannot find what my horse does in the United States. I cannot find what my horse does in South Africa. So I think all these things, it's not only the issuing of papers, but sports results, with sport, uh, results of WFSS or other next to come uh, genetic defaults that we can find it and we can share it in one database. We live in a global world, so why not make a global system? And I think that we need to make a, a group that can uh, make something uh, work that is beneficial for all of us so we can all work together and we have one system for all the stud books that works globally. I'm Alison Corbally from the Irish Sport Horse Stud Book and I'd like to step back one step further. Um, I'm wondering, we have challenges, not with the stallion owners at the top table, because we have a good relationship with you all, but with other stallion owners to define who owns the horse at any particular year, because there's so much trade in stallions now and leasing agreements and contracts. So we have serious difficulties in getting response from stallion owners to enable us to publish our stallion book every, every second year to know actually who owns the horse and what percentage anybody might own. Because if we don't know that, we don't even know who to contact when we have a difficulty. So that's a fundamental problem that we have. Maybe we're unique, but we have that problem. I know the Breeding News historically tried to get an international listing of stallions and the contact details and the, stu the stud books in which they were classified and approved. So that's one issue. The other I mentioned briefly, when stallions are leased to third parties, again, we as stud books are in the dark because we don't know, um, nor should we, know the terms of the lease, but it then has an impact on covering certs. Who under a leased stallion has the rights to sign the covering cert? Um, who has the rights to allow the labs to use the DNA? So the, the lease stallions is a, another complicated area. And finally, a simple thing, well, what should be simple, the health certificates. When a horse is to be newly classified in a stud book, the stud book needs EIA, EVA certification. And currently, that is quite difficult, depending on how responsive the, stallion, the individual stallion owner is. Some, people, some stallion owners, even if you can find who owns the horse, when you correspond, you get no response. So the, the trail that we're talking about regarding payment and covering certs and all the legal agreements, it nearly starts back a little bit more so that somewhere we know who owns what stallions. You, it's, you're pointing a very important uh, a problem of today. Some stallions, and uh, we own today Canaan, and I know that Simon has uh, many, many owners. So Canon will be a big mess for the rest of his life and 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 long time after, but uh, but it's not because we have those problems that we should not start. We should start with day one with some new stallions. Like we have another stallion now. Um, I can name hundreds, but uh, this stallion has one owner at at day one. This owner is registered in the database. If he entrusts semen to Mr. UI or Mr. T he will register Mr. UI or Mr. T in the database as allowed. If Mr. T is selling semen uh, to uh, Mr. X, Mr. T will enter Mr. X in the database so that you are in the database because you are legal to, uh, uh, to sell semen and we can find who gives you this right and, and who the one who gives you the right got the right from. We have to start with new stallions 
like that. Uh, for some of the past, uh, this regulation to become efficient uh, will take 10 years. But it's your dream to start because it will take 10 years. Well, I think even for, for the past, if, uh, if, if the, the people who own or bought the semen legally declare themselves as, uh, as legal uh, stallion owner, uh, then they just have to register themselves, and then if there is a problem, they will go to 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 see a lawyer or thing like this. But if they <coughs> if they are declared themselves in uh, in a database, uh, it's it's a first point. So n not even for for the the, the the new stallions, I think for all the stallions, and it will also solve your problems. So my name is Karina Christiansen from the Danish Wampel Society, and I fully understand your concern. I think maybe also in the future we will appear other problems like, for example, inbreeding problems, especially with the ICSI metals now, because one stallion can produce a tremendous amount of offspring now. So my question for you is, if we build up this uh, universal database, put all data in, will you as a stallion owner be prepared to put a maximum of your stallion saying that, for example, 1,000 offspring and then he has to be out of the breeding because then we also have this transferability and I think we might going to need that for the future. I think we have tried that already <coughs> in the past with uh, to limited breedings of stallions. Uh, so then um, you are at 1,000 in the Danish uh, stud book and then uh, 1,001 goes to Belgium, and uh, 2,001 goes to France, 3,001 goes to Italy, 5,001 goes to Holland. So it's very difficult to limit uh, the amount of breedings. But on the other hand, if you have um, with the inbreeding problems, these problems will be seen, it's much easier to publish. So if there is a thousand breedings and you find a stallion that has a lot of inbreeding difficulties, then you can publish it and then the stallion will not breed anymore, so the problem will solve itself. Absolutely, the, the, the market is, uh, is realist. If, uh, if it's the transparency makes that everybody knows that, uh, I don't know, uh, back to Canaan, that Canaan had produced, or Diamond had produced that many foals, all stood books together last year, the, they'll slow down, they say, okay, I, I want to be one of the 300, but one, not one of the 3,000, so I'll move for another stallion. I think the transparency will benefit the breeders as well, in this point of view. And perhaps we'll also uh, begin another subject, is XC, perhaps uh, it's not especially a good thing, and perhaps it's better to limit it, as they do in the bovine. Uh, at the beginning, they, it helps to, to increase uh, the, the good productions of the good cows, but finally they think that it was too much, and now they limit it. Perhaps we'll also do the same in the equine uh, breeding. But that's another subject later on. And as Anna said, if we have the good information, it will be also better to say that no, now it's too much. It's, it's better to, 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 to limit to only males who really necessitate it. XC can be more considered as a technique of fertilization than a technique of genetic improvement. But this is something the market will regulate also. The transparency will help to create that because the inbreeding will not only come of the number of offspring of one stallion, but the limitation of the stallion's dams. If one stallion dam can produce uh, 60 males in the same year, then then you go, uh, you accelerate the, the risk of uh, of inbreeding. But, but it's, it's it's another subject. I think if we if we can decide to make a, a a small group to make a workshop on this subject. The two, uh, the two things. What time do we deliver the technical certificate to make the fraud more difficult? And uh, how can we create a database to make the transparency and the access of the information for one stallion owner to all the progeny of his stallion, for one breeder to all the progeny of his mare, and for one investor to what part of uh, uh, the production of one mare is acquiring. These two, I, I, I guess I feel from today that on, on these two things we could probably create very briefly in the coming two or three months um, a, a one page of good practice. 
and we can experiment those good practice for one year. And if those good practice are working with no major obstacles, that will become a requirement to become or stay member of the Federation. I think in two phases, I think we need to experiment that for one year because it's you know, some problems we show that we did not expect or can find out in advance. But if after one year of good practice it works at the general satisfaction, it could become, uh, it could become uh, one, one of the commitments of the stud books. Klaus, maybe you want Guillaume? No? I have a question to you. Uh, when, when you do the deals with the mayor owners or someone that you uh, cooperate with to sell your salmon in other countries, what do you have? Do you have a contract with each mayor owner that they are not allowed to sell the salmon further or to how to use the salmon that they buy? Because the reason that I'm asking is uh, when, when we had the problem with the warm blood fragile fold syndrome, we, we wanted to define a contract so that, because it's not easy, d does the one person that has the salmon in our country, do they have the right to test for uh, warm blood fragile fold syndrome on the salmon, for example, if the stallion is no longer alive? So we, we contacted lawyers to look into it, and as far as they could find out, salmon was as any product that once you've sold it, it's up to the one that owns the salmon what they want to do with it. Uh, but if there is a contract between this, uh, the salmon seller uh, that th you're not allowed to do this and that with the salmon, that could prevent that. So wha what do you put down in the contract? Do you have any contract with uh, each mayor owner? So what do you put down in the contract with your cooperation partners in other countries? It's, uh, it's probably as, uh, as much response as, uh, as different situation. I can answer for us as a GFE. 99% um, of our semen uh, we remain the owners and we entrust to our agents in the countries and they get paid on the base of pregnancies or eventually live births and, uh, and they pay us based on that, but we remain the owners of the semen all the time. Uh, it's, not, uh, it's not for all the stallion and some stallion that we own today had a semen was sold before we acquired them, that's, that's the case of Canon, uh, but that's one contract. Uh, it's many other situations, maybe Jeanette and uh, and then Sophie can explain there. I'm just thinking that perhaps the first step, this is not happening. Perhaps the first step, no matter if we have a database or not, which would be good, of course, but to put down in contract with actually each and every person that buys salmon, what they are allowed to do with the salmon to prevent yes, it that it's... It's written on our contract. Yeah, it is. I, it is, yes. Yeah, because I think it's a lot, it's a lot of differences there between different stallion I owners. Yes, but the, the each, each Italian owner makes its own contract, but uh, f for us, we make a, a contract and, uh, and there are some rules to, to, to follow. But um, if uh, we have this database and also the technical certificates, we, we can check uh, everything. Uh, for the moment, we, we can't, but uh, the, 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 the semen is always sell with contracts. <coughs> and I think it's the same for, for Janet. <coughs> a little bit the same agreements. We all have stallions and agents that take care of it, and it's all like they pay per pregnancy. So um, when the breeding fee is uh, is paid, they get a covering certificate, and uh, until that, you are the owner of the of the semen. But once again, if it's no control, uh, even if one, even if it's only one out of thousand roads. Uh, if, it's, um, if it's obliged to stop at the red light, but if you have no radar, the obligation is respected by 99% and the 1% creates the accident. I will, I will come back on what Arno said just um, about this small group. Um, does anybody in the, in the room would be okay to, yeah, to, to build this group of four or five? Uh, maybe under the supervision of uh, someone from the board of the WBFSH, at least to try to write a kind of, to take the, the word that Norbert said on the, on the reading news is gui the guide of good practice for all of uh, the student book members and uh, for, the breeding, uh, for the breeding sector. So I don't know, is there already some, some here in the, in the assembly ready to, to be part of that group? 
and Sophie. <laughs> yeah, but we need stud books too, you know, <laughs> to write it. Sorry? A legal, yeah, a legal advice, yes, should be, of course, very welcome. So, I don't know, Ireland? Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Oui, oui, hein, ils ont la partie légale ouais, pour le conseil. Euh, ouais. Eva OK. So we've got AES, Irish Sport Horse, KWPN. Where is the KWPN? OK, sorry. <laughs> Celle français. We'll be in, and then we have a stallion and IFC as a legal, uh, legal advice. Okay, is it? Yes. Edward Kendall, uh, Department of Cooperation, um, Internal Cooperation. Uh, my question has to do with the uh, ge the uh, geography of this problem. I is there is this a problem that uh, is extant in Europe? Or is it a problem that's extant worldwide? It's no, it's worldwide. worldwide. <laughs> okay. So, well, my, then my issue is it sounds to me just like uh, I think it's a great idea, but it sounds to me like you're approaching it from a very Eurocentric uh, approach. So if the problem exists in South America, whatever you come up with here is probably not going to solve the issue. Uh, I'm just picking South America. I don't, <laughs> you know, I don't know anything. I don't know where the problem well is. Well, we have to begin with something, and but WBFSH already includes most of the main stud books worldwide, so it's it's a beginning. Well, well, I think it does include many of the larger stud books, but it's possible to simply create stud books, as you know. You're really so welcome to be part of the group. No, uh, I'm, ju <laughs> I want, I'm just asking. You're representing uh, Canada. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm just asking because I don't understand the problem. Uh, you know, I understand what you've explained to the problem, but I don't understand where the problem is. But if the problem is, for example, largely in North America, then the property laws there are probably very different than they are here. So you'd have to no, it, see I how binding the contracts are there, et cetera, et cetera. The, 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 problem, the problem is worldwide, I think. It's just that in Europe, because of all of those regulation we are, and actually not the same as in the other part of the world. We, we focus a little bit more on the regulation we have to follow, and most of the um, stallion owners concerned are under those regulations. So that's why we are more maybe talking about Europe, but, but semen is traveling everywhere. And of course, I guess that when the semen arrives somewhere in the US, in Canada, in South Africa, anywhere <laughs> in the other part of the world, yeah. they don't know. Also, so you know, it's uh, it's sold, but uh, then they don't know how many falls Exa and uh, and yeah. may also yeah. sorry, just to finish. I uh, I don't want to speak for you, but I guess that they probably also have different kind of contract when it's not in Europe, when it's third that country that's or something. That's, 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 my that's right. But from my experience, this stood book from the uh, far countries are very inclined to work in transparency. Most of them. I mean, all, all, all the ones I've been talking to in South America and South Africa, New Zealand, Australia, I think New Zealand is here. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and, and, and uh, they're all very inclined in transparency. So uh, I, I think this group of seven can easily build uh, a, a chart of good practice which can be presented to the others. Does that answer your question? <laughs> okay. Great, so a table. I would like to thank you very much, three of you, for this uh, forum. I think it was, I think, I'm, I'm sure, it was very interesting for all of us, all of you, and uh, at least it gives a, a first step for the, for the future. So now, just quick logistical detail, I always. <laughs> um, we have lunch in the town, just as yesterday, so you have quite time to go, it's, uh, it's supposed to start at 1. The General Assembly is uh, starting at uh, half past 2. So yes, papers for the General Assembly are on the top of the meeting room up there, so don't, don't forget to take, s uh, to take them when you will be in. And uh, it's supposed to finish at 6. And at 6, we have a kind of little surprise for you, so it is for those who want. <laughs> for those who want, 
before the buffet this evening. The buffet this evening is at quarter past seven. So it means that we are free between six and quarter past seven. So that's why we propose for those who want a quick tour of the, of the school, of the National Riding School. <laughs> so at least you will see horses that you did not see yet. <laughs> And your, your guides, your guides for that will be Caroline here, and uh, the general director that uh, you met yesterday, Mr. Gaillet. And, and no, 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 not Guillaume, don't follow him, it will be the drivers. <laughs> so Caroline, Jean-Roch, and uh, Jean-Roch Gaillet, and uh, so for those who want the others, you are free, there is a very nice shop of Cadre Noir, I saw that some of you already saw the shop. And anyway, quarter past seven this evening in the town, and uh, and then follow us for the for the musical show this uh, tonight. Thank you and bon appétit. <laughs>